Hi, good morning. Actually, good afternoon. <laughs> My name is Susan Wu. I am in uh, networking and security business unit. And uh, you know, I, I have, did a morning session, so my time difference is uh, a little messed up here. So how many folks are in software development? Ah, okay. Are you working with uh, microservices? Okay. And then uh, are you trying to implement networking and security into each of the services, or are you looking at something like a service mesh? Yes, more like a service mesh. Okay. Okay, um, I just realized I broke the rules. You're not supposed to do Q&A. <laughs> so let's see if we can save it to at the end. Um, so microservices, um, I came from Java and I also did SOA. I, I did SOA as well as now many of the applications are refactored into microservices. Through the generation of software development, um, things are getting better. But actually, uh, it's all about being able to reuse components. And in SOA, when the services include the business logic, in reality, there wasn't a lot of reuse. So uh, because you could pull it together like catalog, the only thing I really saw that was highly reused in, in applications was like the shopping cart. Because uh, I think a lot of it wasn't reused. But in microservices, actually, you're building a lot of components, but you're allowing the teams to choose their programming language and to choose their respective backends. And what we found is that, that all of that provided a lot of flexibility. You could release at your own intervals. You could upgrade at your own intervals. But the only challenge is when it came to networking and security, uh, the engineers had to know something about networking and security. So for example, uh, even in tracing, if you were to use something like Jaeger for tracing, you would need to implement the right language specific um, libraries to implement the tracing. And when you need to connect and secure your services, you need to add that networking and security stack into each of the services. And then when you put together a microservices application, it was really difficult to figure out like between the services, how long it takes for these transactions to take place. So these are some of the things that we encountered when we work with customers. And I um, am part of the NSX Service Mesh product team. We've been working with maybe 70 or 80 uh, customers that are doing uh, microservices all around the world. And this is what they told us. And so Service Mesh is essentially just an abstraction uh, for the developers to write against. So think of it as a, like a specialist, right? Not everybody needs to know networking and security, but you can draw upon this abstraction and you offload that uh, into that abstraction while the developers can concentrate on writing business logic and creating value for the organization. So today I'm just gonna go through really quickly the architecture and then talk about maybe three use cases that are very, very common. You might even use them today. Uh, so service mesh is uh, composed of, uh, the Istio service mesh is composed of two things, uh, the Envoy proxy, which is in the data plane, and then the Istio, which is on the control plane. On the Envoy side, you implement the, uh, the traffic through that proxy. Everything, this is a sidecar proxy, it's a, uh, pod actually, in, it's a container inside that pod actually. So here's a container and that sidecar proxy actually is another container. And then you use that to uh, send traffic inbound out of the, inbound into the pod as well as outbound in the pod. And all of this happens in the layer seven. And so some of the popular use cases of this is uh, implementing things like circuit breaker and I'll talk more about that. And you can uh, perform health checks uh, against that uh, pod. And if with this, you can actually collect a lot of rich metrics because you have that sidecar proxy that's watching essentially both the inbound traffic and the outbound traffic. Uh, so let me build this out. So I mentioned the, uh, the Envoy proxy. So this is a, one of the popular use case of, of this is service to service connection and then you can implement like TLS, like security encryption between the two services. And um, the, on the control plane side, you have functions like uh, configuration management, policies, and certificate management. 
So the configuration is where you uh, configuration config your uh, traffic control rules, which is talking to which, and then the policy management is actually your, your uh, usage policy, the controls and the collection of telemetry data, and also your access control is in that policy engine. And certificate is just lifecycle management of certificates. And you can, that's where you uh, implement your MTLS authorization and encryption. Uh, so I'm, let me talk about the three top use cases that we've been watching the customers. So in Kubernetes, without anything in Istio, it would evenly distribute the traffic across the pods that you have. Very straightforward. Let's say you add a pod, it would still evenly distribute the uh, traffic to say you have four running pods. But if you ha institute something like service mesh, then if you're doing maybe A, B testing or releases, then you can uh, send maybe 99% of the traffic to you know, maybe your first three pods and then maybe even only 1% of the traffic to your new pod just to test some software or to test a new release. So that way you minimize that risk because 99 of your percent of your traffic is sent uh, to the pod with the current release of the software and that 1% is being sent to maybe a new release of your software and maybe it will affect very few of the users because it's only 1% of your traffic. So that's what we've seen. And another uh, example we've been seeing is uh, people implement something called circuit breaking. Circuit breaking is very similar to electricity. You break, you, you turn it off. Essentially, if something, uh, if, if, uh, you know, something is, if you're getting a surge, right? So for example, in a distributed denial of service attack, you're getting a lot of simultaneous requests that's hitting your services. And so if you implement the circuit breaking inside of your YAML, then it can turn off that service and it will not route any traffic to the unhealthy service. And then it will uh, route the rest of the traffic to the ones that are healthy. So that's another example of using something like uh, service mesh. Uh, another uh, example is uh, in, a, uh, in a security scenario, so these services are talking to each other and they are if they're not encrypted, there's a risk of something called a man in the middle attack because it's unencrypted, it's open, right? So that in the traditional application that may not have this, uh, this vulnerability is not as apparent because you might have a set of uh, uh, firewalls in front of your web server or you might have a set of firewalls in front of your app servers or you might even have another set of firewalls in front of your da database servers. But in this case, the services are talking to each other, so there's a need for encryption of the service to service communication. And that can be done with this as well. You can institute um, the MTLS between the services. Uh, just to digress, in the NSX service mesh product that we're building, which is the commercial product that we're building with a management plane on top of the open source, we have made this possible where you could selectively encrypt between the services or unencrypt uh, because you don't want to apply the overhead. So in the, in the NSX service mesh product, we've let the operator choose which services that they want to encrypt and then so they can selectively encrypt and unencrypt. And so that is uh, my presentation. So I'm going to switch to questions now. Any questions? Uh, how, how are you using Kubernetes? Just to, uh, because I have a colleague from the uh, Modern Apps Business Unit. Anyone using Kubernetes? If you could tell us how you're using it. Ah, okay. So OpenShift, we are okay with that here at VMware. <laughs> Uh, because you can use networking across OpenShift and across your vSphere cluster. Uh, we, we actually support many, many forms of Kubernetes. Uh, so we actually are now the number two contributor into Kubernetes. And uh, in terms of certified Kubernetes, there's, there's over a hundred. Uh, what is your experience uh, with OpenShift? Uh, just starting. Uh, actually, in fact, you might want to talk to my colleague. Uh, he has a lot of experience actually implementing open. Uh, uh, he has a lot of experience op uh, implementing Kubernetes at customer sites.
So it's always good to trade information. Do you?